that worked. All right. So the first idea we're discussing around Taleb and his book Anti-Fragile and applying it to education, learning, and career, I wanted to start, Luke, with his Fat Tony example in the book. You haven't yeah, got to that yet? I haven't right. gotten up to And the yet. Green Lumber Fallacy. No. I want to talk about them. So he uses a fake character in his book sometimes called Fat Tony, which is like kind of a typical, I don't know, it sounds like an Italian-American New Yorker with the kind of the accent and the opinionated and it's that kind of archetype of character. And he uses him to demonstrate a lot of his points and contrast him to other, other people and the way they think. So I guess this Fat Tony character, is not, it's not incre- he's not incredibly academic. He's not incredibly intellectual necessarily or fancy or, or highbrow society or theoretical, right? But as Taleb points out in the book, this Fat Tony character can overcome his shortcomings by being shrewd. And that's just what he does. So there's a very funny line where, he, where Fat Tony's looking at like, all right, he, he looks at experts and all this stuff and they're always predicting the future, right? It's just what experts do, except he knows that the experts are usually wrong about their predictions. So instead of trying to go and accumulate all this knowledge, he just starts betting against the experts. And because of that, Fat Tony becomes a millionaire, right? And he he doesn't necessarily know much about anything, except being aware of his own ignorance can actually um, bring him to a place of like considerable Success in the domain of <laughs> earning millions of dollars. And it, when I was reflecting on this, it really reminds me in my kind of my context, all of the Australian Lebanese uh, men in particular in my family, many who migrated from Lebanon, they didn't really have formal educations and they lacked the qualifications for like the traditional high earning, high status professions. So they were, they were drawn to construction and property development because the barrier to entry was much lower, right? Basically, you didn't need a degree, you didn't need a long qualification process. And they could overcome being like borderline illiterate and still make millions, if not tens of millions of, of dollars, right? Which is it's a lot of shekels. Not that that's the point, obviously, for anyone who knows the themes of the podcast, but it's just very interesting that, you know, you can be a, a high school dropout and become a multimillionaire through property. And my dad's best friend is a fantastic example because he was not great at school. He dropped out in year 10. He started working as a butcher because that's what his family business did. My dad's family business was in property. And then because they were great friends, he eventually, you know, he was a hungry guy. He had an incredible attitude and work ethic, even though he wasn't like kind of like Fat Tony, not, not great, not, not the best like kind of intellectual around. But he went and applied himself and created a very – very, very good life for himself, done very, very well on any metric, you know, not just financially, but also has a lot of autonomy, which sometimes people actually sacrifice when they're making money. So I just think that that's like a, a fantastic example. It's not that you, you can have a degree and a formal education and use it to do great stuff, obviously, right? And it, this doesn't apply to everything, but you can overcome your shortcomings, Right, And I think that awareness, I think that's what Taleb helps you think about. I don't think that that is a big part of our education system now. I also don't think it's a big part of our cultural narrative. Right, Instead of figuring out how they overcome their shortcomings, a lot of people just get really resigned to the fact that I'm not the highest IQ person or I wasn't born with all this fortune and opportunity. Then I want to move on there. The other idea I want to talk about was the green lumber fallacy in the book. So Taleb talks about another book he read, sounds interesting, called What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars by these guys Jim Paul and Brendan Moynihan. And in it, they talk about a trader they used to work, one of them used to work with, or a story about a trader who used to trade in green lumber, which is actually timber. And he made millions of dollars doing this, right? Except he thought that green lumber was actually green in color. It's actually just a term for freshly cut timber. That's basically it. So he had no idea what he was actually like investing in, but he made a lot of money doing it. Whereas the narrator in that book, What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars, had all these elaborate theories and tried to master the dynamics of the markets and all this stuff and loses heaps of money. So I think with the narrative we have around kind of success and intelligence and everything, it's, it's a massive 180. 
it seems like a massive 180 because you've got the the kind of intellectual approach in that example is fruitless whereas like the kind of naive thing and again it comes back to suggesting that perhaps awareness of ignorance can be more useful than like just incredible intellectual power especially in something like trading or investing i know it made me my reflection of this and I, i'm keen because i do want to make this applicable luke i'm going to invite you to kind of join me in this part i think choosing the right game for you is like probably more than half the battle in life if that makes sense like it's got to be far more yeah. so thinking bigger than just traditional kind of career paths i was thinking about how this applied to me so i think for me one thing I don't really buy into what authority figures say just because they're authority figures. So I think experts are useful when you want to replicate exactly what they've done or they have some sort of framework that can really be personally applied to you. But I think as, as a rule of thumb, I think most people place too much stock in what experts say without clarifying it further, right? I don't know how you think about that. And if you filter that already, or if that's a new concept from the book. I have an idea around, <laughs> I like bring it back yep. to the sales idea. For example, when, when I was doing okay in one of my first jobs in a retail setting, some, some people would say, some people in the store I was working at would say, how are you, so how are you selling X amount, right? But I could never really point to specific things. Like there was no, there was no specific questions. There was no, it's, it's like the thing I think about is how do you, how do you describe picking up on body language? <laughs> <laughs> or tone, or t or yeah. tones of voice, which is such a massive part of like communicating with someone. It's you can't. It's very difficult to describe. You're just in when you're in the moment. You you can pick up on the body language, tone of voice, and everything like that. But it's very below the. It's very below the surface, and it's something you can't really. You can try and write about it. I've read a lot of sales books, which are saying that these are the steps you need to take. But often when, when, you, when, when you're in a successful, when you have a successful sale and you get along with a person after it, you can't really point to the, pro, the exact process of how you achieve that outcome, and so if that, that makes sense. what I think speaks to is the notion of a craft. And a craft is, is such a big embedded kind of subconscious element. There's so much of it's happening outside of your kind of conscious processes, if that makes sense. Mm. But those yeah, you know, crafts and those sort of skills, like Roger Federer playing tennis, he can't really tell you how he plays tennis and how you can replicate it. And so it's, it's incredibly hard to transfer, isn't it? And this is why for me, the notion that yeah. there are just these secrets um, that people have, I think one application of this green lumber fallacy, I don't myself buy into paying premiums for people's knowledge as a result. Because I think I acknowledge, like you, that even if there is gold there, it's not necessarily easy for them to uh, transfer that value over to me. So I think a lot, I, I'm not really big on, you know, the most I normally pay for knowledge is a book, right? But even then I'm becoming more sparing with my with reading books. As you know, like I'm getting way more, I'm filtering that way more. I do, mm. what I do instead is I place way more value on con, like continual, I think you do too, continual interaction with people. Like I'm very big on the concept of online communities. Obviously the constant student is one. I think that's the future of learning because instead of just trying to get what some, um, I don't know, normally celebrity or expert figure, get the knowledge in their head and apply it to you. I think it's more valuable to have some group of people um, with varying experiences, not necessarily world class. I think it's actually more valuable to have them trying to help you through the stages of your journey than it is to have the, just the, the knowledge of someone like world class, but just the knowledge and no help impl mm. implementing things. But I also think people give you uh, feedback. And so, like you can give me feedback on my podcast, right? The Sim Nicholas Taleb won't. So what's more useful, like reading books about podcasting or getting feedback on my podcast? So for me, it gets to the point of learning through experience much faster um, because so much of this is just mm. experiential. And it's about situational awareness, yeah, I think. I that Fat Tony thing is kind of like situational awareness. Yeah. We also try and... One thing I was thinking about is we're trying to... We sometimes try and learn 
from things that are mass produced. They're meant for they're meant for a large audience. So how do you tailor that towards a very specific person's life situation? It's very very difficult. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree. All right. So what we'll do there? That's that's I think one big idea from the book. Now I think next we'll go to fragility, robustness, and anti fragility.